I want my children and the people that love me, I want them to know that whatever they strip from me, they've taken my dignity before, they've stripped me of everything before, and I'm still standing. So no matter what, even if I die, to my last breath, I will be fighting. Because there's a huge lie here. The lie of January 6th is, is a big one. And, um, and I don't believe that people on any side of the aisle really want to be lied to. I don't believe that. Sure, there. I loved being part of 60 Minutes. I loved the people I worked with. I was so proud of everything that we did. Um, and I still am. But I was never going to be beholden to anything but the truth. Never. And so you, what they did, what God did really, was he set me free. <laughs> You know, he yeah. set me free and, and I've always been free in my work, even when I was at those places. And I don't think that I could have been free there today. I want to dive right in with my first guest. Laura Logan's candid reporting, often from the most dangerous places in the world, has earned her a prominent place among the world's best foreign correspondents and her role at 60 Minutes. Logan helped us understand the political and human conflicts around the world, including Pakistan, Iraq, Afghanistan, Israel, and Palestine, and Egypt. Her fearless determination to get the story from its vortex, no matter how dangerous, has often put Logan herself in great danger. It's also earned her multiple awards, including Emmys and an Edward R. Murrow. Her latest independent project is a docu-series on January 6th, The Rest of the Story. Please welcome Laura Logan. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. It's such an honor, as usual, to have another journalist with true integrity and bravery join me. Um, I'm sure you're just as disgusted as me seeing what's happened to journalism in recent years, especially. But we're talking about your January 6th uh, documentary that I know that you've been working on, and we're going to play that trailer after our interview so we, we can get you on your way to other things. But the first episode, uh, I had a chance to watch that, focusing on Matthew Perna, Perna and it's, it's such a devastating story. It's just part one. And uh, I just wanted to ask, you know, there's going to be a lot more to this. There's going to be Matthew Perna, and there's going to be a lot of other things that you're digging into. But why did you pick this as your project to hone in on at this time? You know, it's a it's a good question. Why do you choose the stories that you choose as a journalist, right? And I've always gravitated to stories that um, maybe haven't been told or haven't been told properly. In this case, it's it's the part of the January 6th story that has been uh, completely and utterly censored. And I was I started this because I um, I watched a documentary by a January 6th prisoner called Jake Lang who's been in prison for years now without a trial, much of it in solitary confinement. And I discovered watching this documentary that Jake Lang had, had saved um, the life of a protester called Philip Anderson. And, um, and he had been right there at the scene where this other woman, Roseanne Boyland, died. And I was shocked that I had never heard her name. I couldn't believe it, especially since as a journalist, you know, it's kind of my, my responsibility to stay connected and to stay in tune and, and someone else who's, you know, who's doing their job every day and trying to you know, take care of their family. I mean, they're not absorbed in the news all the time. And so it's understandable if they haven't heard it, but not me. I felt guilty. And, um, and then strangely enough, uh, a while later, I got a call from Jake Lang from prison. And he said, I want you to tell this story. And that's how it, it really started. Of course, you know, I'm uncontrollable because I'm a real journalist. So I said, okay, Jake, I'm gonna do this, but I gotta do it as a journalist. And, um, and that's what we did. We embarked upon this series and I was lucky to find a, a partner in Ben Swan at Truth and Media. Um, because Ben as a journalist he, and uh, someone who's been targeted himself, he really understands and um, and appreciates the value of of investigative journalism because today you know there's very few people doing uh, real investigative scripted standard traditional journalism there's a lot of people doing shows like this 
which is really important. And there's people like Tucker, who's got just a huge audience, who's doing such an important thing with big interviews on Twitter. But who's doing this? And how many people really know how to tell a story the way 60 Minutes would tell it? Very, very few. And what I realized is that um, this is really what I do best. I mean, I've been under pressure from a lot of people to do, you know, to do what you're doing and to do a show like that. And it's tempting. I would love to do that. But who's going to do this? This is hard and it's expensive and most people don't want to pay to do this. And before, when I did it in 60 Minutes, I had the network behind me. I had the news divisions, resources and, and so on. Now it's a tiny team, right, of, of people who are very, very committed and, and who are learning. We're learning as we go because they didn't, none of them worked at 60 Minutes. And so I'm sharing a lot of that and it, it feels good and it feels right because we can't let this type of journalism disappear. We can't let it just fade away and die because people don't want to pay for it and because people don't remember what it is. And so then as we, you know, once once I, I started to work on that and uh, talk to Ben about Roseanne Boylan and her story, he said, can we do some more? You know, can we tell these other stories as well? So the big one for us is Roseanne Boylan. There's going to be at least five episodes on her story. And, and in the end, we'll put all that together and, and package that as a film as, you know, for people who want to watch it like that. But the other stories, the Matthew Pernas story, the Jeremy Brown story, you know, these are done as 20 minute episodes. Um, and Matthew ended up being part, two parts. And I, and I really wanted to do his story because once again, when I heard um, about this young man and understood that he represented so many people on January 6th. People who went there with no violent intent, who were never charged of, with a violent crime, who were just simply like anybody else in history, rep, you know, exercising their First Amendment rights, their right to protest, their right to carry out civil disobedience without, you know, being put in solitary confinement for, you know, forever. Um, when I learned about Matthew Perna's story, I felt some guilt and some responsibility that we as, uh, as citizens of this country are allowing this to happen. And especially someone like me as a journalist, that I'm neglecting this subject and these people. And, um, and so it was really important for me to do what I could to do my part in telling the truth, because there's a huge lie here. The lie of January 6th is, is a big one. And, um, and I don't believe that people on any side of the aisle really want to be lied to. I don't believe that. Sure, there um, are people, you know, I'm not trying to convince you. I'm not trying to, you know, I'm not selling something, right? I'm not selling anything. I'm not an activist. I'm not a lawyer. Um, I'm not standing up in a court of law trying to prove a case. I'm just a journalist. Yeah, and, and we appreciate that you're digging deep because that is, you're right, absolutely lost in this news cycle. There's so many different things coming after you that, that many of us don't necessarily have the time to dig deep and get the facts of any one thing. And so it's so needed and it's a space that we need more of. But um, as far as the, you know, you're just doing what a good journalist would, being a voice for the voiceless, holding those in power accountable. There's only been really one accepted narrative on this particular subject. And because of that, you have, I'm sure, faced opposition. And uh, I noticed that one of the features, Philip Anderson, who you just mentioned, he had posted that just after saying he was part of this project, he was arrested. So what other forms of opposition have you already faced as you are just now starting to roll this out? Well, of course, there's all the people attacking online, you know, that's standard and to be expected. You don't even know if they're people, right? I mean, some of them could be bots. Some of them uh, behind those bots are paid propagandists and political assassins is what they really are, right? In fact, what they really are is a bunch of assholes who are paid to go and, and tell lies about other people. I mean, that's, you know, um, but they are also propagandists and, um, and very destructive because they have destroyed people's lives. They were instrumental in destroying Matthew Perna. I mean, some of them bear responsibility, that onslaught, you know, even if it's fake because it's, uh, because it's an algorithm, you know, or it's a bot, it still has an impact. And increasingly what we see is this, this what's going on in the digital world where we have no idea whether it's real or not real impacting us in the real world, you know, and we've got to stop allowing that to happen. And, you know, I, 
I want to tell you one of the reasons I did Matthew Perna's story is is simply this. His aunt Jerry said to me once she was at a meeting with a bunch of other January 6 families and they were all petitioning for various things, you know, unjust things that had happened to their family members, all of whom were behind bars. And I remember Jerry looking at me and she said, I felt so lost in this group. I felt like I didn't belong. And I said, why? And she said, because all I could think about listening to them talk is how grateful I would be to be in their position because they still had hope. They had hope that they could do something. They had hope that their, their, their son or their father or their, you know, their husband could come home. Yeah. And Matthew's family don't have any hope. He's gone and he's never it's coming. It's so back. sad. It's so sad. And I mean, that's, I'm sure what drives you is to, again, tell people's stories. I mean, that is the driving factor here, but um, I got to ask you, and what's tell it felt stories, like? Tell the, the, let me, sorry to interrupt you here. I want to say this. Tell those stories the way we did at 60 Minutes. Bring those people to life yeah. so that they're not just a name on a page. You know, I had, a, I had a former prosecutor I was talking to researching this say to me, I never thought about defendants when I was a prosecutor. They were just a name on a page. And that's what you realize, you know, for everybody, this is just another January 6th. And we, uh, because the media doesn't do its job anymore, we don't know who any of these people are. And they just fit a false narrative. And so we never get to walk in their steps. We never find out how, you know, how funny Roseanne Borland was. We never find out how cool Matthew Perna was. We never find out, you know, how extraordinarily brave Philip Anderson is, you know? Um, and so that's part of my job too, is, uh, is to just, is to bring these people to life. And in telling their stories, the audience can make up their own mind. And I mean, to that end, we, we, we don't find out things like uh, Matthew Perna having been a Bernie Sanders supporter. They just want to lump all of mm -hmm. these January Sixers into supposed crazed um, extremist Trumpers or, or whatever. And to that end, I was going to ask you, you know, because of the smears, what's it been like to go from being an Emmy award winning, a, a person that's gotten morose, a person that's you've literally put your life on the line to <laughs> have exceptional yeah. journalism, you know, and worked and were esteemed, you know, you were 60 minutes for and correspondent. I mean, that those things are huge. What's it like to go from yeah. that to, to trying to follow the path of integrity and tell the truth and be smeared as a MAGA or a far right extremist. I mean, that's got to be crazy. Yes, I was just joking with one of um, my old colleagues from CBS, who's um, who is a very special man. I said to him, "I'm I'm going to write the book on how to succeed in reverse." <laughs> Because I started, you know, I started out at the networks and at CBS and 60 Minutes, which was the top, and then I was at Sinclair, which is local news, and now nobody will hire me. I mean, I got kicked off. I've been kicked off places I don't even work, right? I get canceled by everybody. And so, um, and I did have um, an independent journalist once and kept asking me, what's it like at the Emmys? And oh, I, I didn't understand. Why does he care? It's like, it's a bunch of self-serving assholes a lot of the time, not always, but a lot of the time. And they're, you know, busy. Uh, they're puffed up with their chests up about how, and they're so self-righteous. And why do you care? And then I realized, you know, everybody wants recognition. We all want recognition. And I appreciated getting those awards at the time. And it saddens me that they've been reduced to nothing because now you give awards mm -hmm. to people for things like Russia collusion that didn't even happen. They're not even real. And when you find out, you know, even though you should have known at the time if you were a real journalist, but even when you do find out and it is exposed, you do nothing about it. I mean, give those awards back. Ask for them back. You as an award society, if you're worth anything, ask for them back and say, you know, we were misled. We were deceived and we were misled. And we're, you know, we're going to reset here and look closely at what we do because that's not right. But they don't do that. They're not honest enough. They don't have enough integrity. And they're not brave enough to do that, quite frankly. So for me, what it's like is this. I never sold my soul. And I always... I, I mean, I do everything today the way I did it at 60 Minutes. You know, I work just as hard, probably harder. Um, and I am um, just, uh, I'm, I'm honest. I believe that integrity matters. 
I never have lied and said that journalism is purely objective. No, I've always been honest and said journalism is very subjective. But there is an objectivity in the process of looking at everything from all sides, of forcing yourself to do things that you may not instinctively want to do, you know, um, of, of keeping an open mind, keeping an open heart, sticking to firsthand sources where you can, uh, really pushing yourself right? Not to just take no for an answer. I mean, even the, the Justice Department and many others tell us over and over and over again, no, 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 we're not going to talk to you. At least, you know, going back time and time and time again, giving them another opportunity, because I'm not just looking for the, oh, they didn't want to talk to us, right? We're not just trying to do that. We're trying to find ways beyond the politics. We're trying to find ways you know, pass through the obstacles or you know, over these mountains that they put in your way so that you can't get to the truth. And um, and you have to, you know, I have to be able to look at myself in the mirror and say, I, I know I gave you every opportunity. You know, if something comes up later and you want to talk about it and it's material, okay, I'll acknowledge that. But But you'll never be able to say that I wouldn't give you a chance. You'll never be able to say that I was blind. You'll never be able to say that I intentionally overlooked things because they didn't fit the narrative. The, those things will never, ever be found in my reporting and in my work. You know, I mean, maybe there'll be things that you can pick apart. Sure, there always are. I mean, we're just human, you know, and we're doing our best against the odds. But I would say that, you know, it's been a journey for me and I finally learned to be very grateful. I am, I am free, you know. Um, those things, while they were great, I loved being part of 60 Minutes. I loved the people I worked with. I was so proud of everything that we did. Um, and I still am. But I was never going to be beholden to anything but the truth. Never. And so you, what they did, what God did really, was he set me free. <laughs> You know, he yeah. set me free and, and I've always been free in my work, even when I was at those places. And I don't think that I could have been free there today because, you know, I mean, I'm doing a story that involves some of the story involves Ray Epps. It's not just about him. And none of what we have learned was in the 60 minutes piece. And that makes no sense to me because it wasn't hard to find this stuff out. And so um, I... I that is just an example, one example of how um, I could never have been at that show today because when they did that story, they didn't even try to find the truth. And that is not uh, the 60 minutes that we gave out heart and soul to, you know, it's just not. Right. And people there know it. They don't want to admit it because nobody says, oh, I want to give everything up and have nothing, but I'm still going to be free. <laughs> Yeah. Nobody well, it's so refreshing that. to hear you say that and encouraging. And I hope you will continue to say that because people in my position also, I mean, I joke with my husband, cry to my husband sometimes like, man, I just feel like sometimes, even though I know what I'm doing is right, it does feel like it's going in reverse, you know, to be beloved and win awards from the Associated Press and things like that. Now I'm yeah. like, now they're, now that's baloney. And now I have to struggle. And yeah. you know what I mean? Um, but it, it's <laughs> encouraging to hear that. Um, it, and really you know what I want to tell you? I want to tell you something. Um, there's a film, I think, To Kill the Messenger, which is about the journalist Gary Webb. And of course, you'll find things online about Gary Webb. People still say, you know, he was wrong and blah, blah, blah. But he, he wrote this series called Dark Alliance, which was all about how the CIA was bringing crack cocaine, introduced crack cocaine to the street in America in black neighborhoods. You know, and we know what crack cocaine has done to those neighborhoods and those families and those people, right? I mean, the legacy of that is still there to this day. So that is a, a is not a small thing. And when he wrote that series, at first, everybody wanted a piece of him and, and everybody was all about how great his journalism was. And then systematically, CIA probably leaking behind the scenes to the Washington Post and the New York Times and all of these powerful organizations and they destroyed Gary Webb, absolutely destroyed him. They stripped him of his Pulitzer Prize. They stripped him of his job. He lost, you know, his everything and became, uh, and he died alone in the end. They say he committed suicide by shooting himself twice in the head, which would be an extraordinary achievement. <laughs> but the reason I tell yeah. you about this is that Gary Webb wrote a book before he died. People can read it. And I've, I, I've never forgotten one of the things he wrote in there, which was, 
is that uh, you know that he was he was sort of going along and he was winning awards and he was judging journalism contests and you know and and he he was like so many of us he said and then he wrote dark alliance and he discovered that all those things he had were not because he was so good at his job and so uh, you know dutiful and accurate and all the rest of it it wasn't for any of those reasons that he was so successful. And it was simply that he'd never written anything important enough to suppress. Wow, that's that's really powerful. Now there's so much more I wanted to ask you, but I know that you have to make your rounds and, and um, make sure people are aware of this truth. I mean, because they're gonna, certainly gonna try and suppress this docu-series on January 6th, the rest oh, of the story. Oh, they'll keep attacking me. They never stop. <laughs> they'll it's okay, they'll attack you. people on the show. They'll attack, you know, the people I'm working with. They'll attack all of us. They will write things and they will say things and it's okay. I mean, we're used to that. I think millions of people see through it now and they're tired of these tactics. Yeah. Well, make sure that you get the word out. We're going to do our best to get the word out about this as well. And we'd love to have you back um, when, when you're kind of gone through that and we can dig into some of these other topics I had. Um, but good luck with this. And um, thank, thank you, you so for much. being brave and telling these people's stories, following the tenets of journalism to be a voice for the voiceless and hold these people accountable. Um, and is there, is there just any final word of hope that you, I mean, because you had to kind of go to a dark place in, in, in telling these stories. What hope do you have that you can leave us with? I'm so bad at that, right? Um, but I do, I, I think what's important to leave people with is, uh, is what Jeremy Brown said in one of his interviews with me. When I said, you could be here forever. And he said, I'll be here as long as the American people leave me here. And so I think what I wanna leave people with is, is that understanding. We, we, the people have the power to change this. And, uh, and if we don't, that is exactly what will happen. Jeremy Brown will be there forever and they'll be more like Jeremy Brown. They'll be coming for you, they'll be coming for me. I've already tried to prepare my family just a little bit, you know, and to, and to let my children know that if I ever get taken away, you gotta know I'm strong. You gotta know that um, I love you. You've gotta know that no matter what, they'll never break me and mm -hmm. i um and wherever i am and whatever the circumstances i will be unbroken my spirit will be unbroken and the things i'm fighting for for you so that you don't that you get to live with freedom they will never take those things away they'll never change them they won't and i just want you know i want my children and the people that love me i want them to know that Whatever they strip from me, they've taken my dignity before, they've stripped me of everything before, and I'm still standing. So no matter what, even if I die, to my last breath, I will be fighting. So good. Thank you for leaving us with that inspiration. Laura Logan, with the rest of the story, January 6th, make sure you check it out, Truth and Media. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.